It's going to get grim, folks. This is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Billie Holiday. This isn't a record review per se, it's a personal reflection on a record that occupies a strange place in me and not always a comfortable one. The record in question is Lady in Satin by Billie Holiday. There are two kinds of jazz singers, Billie Holiday and everyone else. And amongst everyone else there are equally two kinds of jazz singers those who came before Billie Holiday and those who came after, who themselves are equally cursed and blessed, cursed to live in her shadow and blessed to be able to learn from her craft. And while here on the final album issued in a lifetime, the voice wavers at times with its ravages, the craft is impeccable. I'm a fool to want you alone is enough to make a believer of even the stoniest hearted cynic. From the dismal and hideous quarters of Sandtown in Baltimore and a dismal and hideous childhood, prostituted by a mother at 10, singing in bars at 12, through violent and neglectful marriages and debilitating addictions to heroin and booze, somehow Holiday managed to balance all this death and defeat and degradation with a ray of inextinguishable hope in her heart. And that was her fundamental approach to a lyric to resolve it from sadness to hope through hope. Her other great gift was her approach towards melody and rhythm. Everyone else before seemed to form the words to the melody of a song, but Holiday would reinvent the melody to suit the words, and her revolutionary approach to phrasing turned songs often banal on the hands of others into sweets shaded by the emotional equivalent of a narrative arc. And her unnerving habit of singing slightly behind the beat created a sense of linger in the world of the lyric which none before had attempted and few since have mastered. Another gift Holiday brought, which made her peerless as a jazz singer and revolutionary as a pop singer, was her ability to emphasise with individual instrumentalists. Most famously Lester the Prayer's Young, but also later after Young's drinking had destroyed him. Ben Webster served not only as a foil, but as a partner in Holiday's instinctive ability to pierce and illuminate a lyric. On Lady in Satin, it's the great J.J. Johnson and the usually somewhat divisive Irby Green who provide the butterfly fragile trombone solos. But there's damage to be done, because Holiday is indelible and predominant. The record has a shaded reputation. Disowned and disregarded on release and not re-released for many, many years after, the album issued after her death, Last Sessions, went 40 years without a re-release. The record has been the subject of embarrassment and apology amongst fans ever since, for many reasons, but chiefly because it lacked the improvisations which made Holiday so famous and remarkable. Even its own producer felt compelled to write in the liner notes, Is it jazz? But it does have its defenders, including a dogged one in the foul quince, and I'll try to tell you why here. The album begins with this indisputable masterpiece, I'm a Fool to Want You. One of Holiday's most devoted disciples, Frank Sinatra, who on hearing of her death holed up in his penthouse for two days, weeping, drinking and playing her records. He had two attempts at recording the song in 1951 and again on his seminal Where Are You album, but he doesn't come close to Lady Day. No one does. No one ever will. This is, to me, one of the very greatest of the great recordings ever made. For heaven's sake shows up the dichotomy Holiday wanted to be at the centre of the album, Ray Ellis's almost easy listening strings, giving the arrangement the sense of 
confection Holiday wanted and her voice providing the sandpaper. Ellis was so surprised when he learned that Holiday wanted him as her arranger for this record, he declared he didn't think she'd ever heard of him. You Don't Know What Love Is is the kind of song Holiday at this point in her life was destined to sing. Whereas average singers fulfill a song and great singers inhabit it, Holiday here haunts it as a swirling, winnowing vesper of voice, whispering it through a winter's sky of pain. Do you know how lost I feel at the thought of reminiscing, and how lips the taste of tears lose their taste for kissing? Sonata and Chet Baker, the two previous exemplars for the song, simply seem like men wearing masks next to Holiday who seems like a ghost who's barely wearing her own skin. I get along without you very well, set against the gewgaws, gimcrackery and folderol of Ellis's arrangement, seems like bravado. The perky melody is toyed with in the manner of holiday of 20 years before, but the voice breaks at the places where the lyric in its reflectiveness forces it to. This is where the contrast between Ellis's and holiday's approach works best. Where it is perhaps least effective is on For All We Know, where for all of Holiday's artistry and genuine soul, Ellis's work's intrusive. If you can find the quiet inside yourself to totally focus on Holiday, it is exquisitely pain. But now and then, one of Ellis's devices does knock rather too loudly on the door of the space that the vocal builds for itself. Which is not to say that Ellis's work is not inventive or genuinely offered. Holiday explained to her producer Irving Townsend that she wanted a pretty album. She knew her voice wasn't in great shape, but equally she knew the reserves she did have to draw on and she trusted them. And she felt that the sandpaper and sugar approach would guarantee a unique and effective outcome. Ellis, who had no pretensions to great art, gamely served up what Holiday wanted and in most cases worked very well. Now that's not to say it was a smooth relationship. Ellis was constantly frustrated by Holiday's lateness for sessions, her inability to learn material and the -the on-the-spot rehearsal she held, as well as her drinking, and Holiday was unused to Ellis' use of introductory stanzas and strict song format. She also hated the, quote, white bitches Ellis hired as backing vocalists. That said, it was Ellis who took Holiday on a cab ride through Manhattan in the wee hours, looking for a record store that was open when she was unable to learn enough new material to complete the album and needed another song. They found the sheet music for You've Changed and Colony Music at 3am. And Holiday did praise Ellis's work, saying the strings were a comfort to her, and she booked him for her next album, even going so far as to switch labels to be able to work with him. Ellis also, in an attempt to rehabilitate the album's reputation in the 1990s, wrote in an essay on its eventual reissue that he'd been unhappy with Holiday's singing, but he acknowledged he'd been listening to her musically at the time, not emotionally, thus becoming one of the album's few defenders. Side A's closer, Violets for My Furs, is the one song where Holiday really buys into her dream of making a pretty album. She sings very hand in glove with Ellis's not over cloying arrangement, and J.J. Johnson's solo is decorative more than expository. But her craft is still supreme, the lines, You smiled at me so sweetly, since then one thought occurs which set up the close so cleverly, are so artfully phrased it reminds us that she is a singer as much of singular technique as of emotional calibre. And this was, by the way, Holiday's personal favourite from the session. Side A is just a teaser, however, for Side B's Grand Slam. The side opens with the defiantly heartbroken 3am in the Manhattan morning of You've Changed. The song recorded, and one she did so while openly crying. Miles Davis, who proclaimed his love for the album at the time, got it right when he said, Sometimes you can sing words to a song every night for five years and suddenly it dawns on you what the song means. You've Changed was the only song from the sessions that Holiday had sung before and maybe she saw the change in herself between those recordings and lost herself for a moment in the pathos of her own story. It's easy to remember. 
To those less literally minded than me, it must be tempting to see this song as a metaphor for Holiday's long-standing issues with heroin. I prefer, in a rare moment of borderline deconstruction, to see it as a lens through which she can look back on her life, much as John Lennon would do in various songs, but a lens which focused on the sadness, the indignity, the loss, and the abandonment. Why well, choose such a lens? Perhaps it was because Holiday was drinking gin and soda by the pitcher during the sessions, and presumably preloaded beforehand which is not conducive to cheery reminisce, or perhaps she knew, as David Bowie said, if you want to see your audience dwindle, only sing songs about what a happy lad you are. He thinks the former. But beautiful with its gorgeous trumpet solo from Mel Davis, seems on the surface to be like Violet for My Furs, Holiday indulging in her dream of positioning or reasserting herself as a singer palatable to mass market tastes, but the beautiful fragility and tangible pain in the line. It's a heartache, either way. It reminds us that the only kind of singer she will ever be is Billy Holiday, which history would soon enough prove to be more than enough. Glad to be unhappy is most likely the straightest reading on the album as much as anything from a singer as singular and unpredictable as Holiday could be. This seems like a last airing of her bag of tricks, the half bends, the shifts in pitch and reharmonization, both from a technical and expository standpoint. Full of clever rhymes and wry ironies, it is ably supported by one of Ellis's least intrusive arrangements. One small arch point. Looking at the cover of the album, with Holiday looking so poised and elegant, Pay close attention to the rhinestone string around her neck. How tightly it presses into her flesh. Once you see it. We end as we began on a masterpiece, I'll Be Around. By every definition a jazz standard, but no one has ever approached it or been so wholly consumed by it as Holiday. One of her greatest devices, one that marked her style from the very start of her career, is her ability to find the guts of a lyric and to change the emphasis on the words to align it with the emotional compass she's using to navigate it. In this case, there's a smouldering determination behind her reading, a, a, a determination to outlast and endure beyond whatever current passion her inamorata is going through. So the emphasis shifts from I'll be around to I'll be around. It's a reading that moves between her declaring her intent in the personal sections and privately ruminating on the nature of what the world will be like when her dream and highly idealized lover inevitably becomes available. Listen to her ragged pitching in Goodbye Again and If You Find a Love Like Mine and her struggle to keep her voice from cracking on When Things Go Wrong Perhaps You'll See You're Meant For Me at 1 minute 52. This is the price you pay for Holiday's art. She reads a lyric so closely, sometimes its truth comes out in a very naked voice, and you can't judge her harshly for that. That's part of the package you buy into when you buy a Billy Holiday record. Lady in Satin divided fans on its release, and it has done so ever since. The move from jazz to a purest pop setting was a major talking point on release, and since then, the quality of her voice, the perception of the lack of sympathy in Ellison's arrangement, and the lack of interplay with the musicians has dominated since. Of course, as befits Jazz's need for the tragic and doomed artist, she died. A sad, tawdry, needless death. Handcuffed by the FBI to a charity bed in a Harlem hospital, with a guard on her door to keep her friends from seeing her, with 70 cents in her bank account and 15 $50 bills taped to the inside of her thigh, which was the fee from a tabloid interview she'd lined up, she'd intended to make a gift of it to the nurses who'd looked after her. Her voice was gone, her liver and kidneys had failed, and she was facing prison as soon as the FBI deemed her well enough to travel. Perhaps that noble ray of hope that coloured her art finally, once briefly flickered, blinked out. But death is too rigid for Holiday. She's like her voice. She's there one moment, 
gone the next, bright here, dim there, sharp and driving once and then warm and enveloping. And that's all that needs to linger. Listen for it. Listen to Billie Holiday and you will believe. Well, I certainly hope you found today's presentation to be interesting, that it piqued your curiosity and that it wasn't altogether too sad. As a point to take away for discussion, uh, the classic canon is littered with singers who had fantastic voices but very little idea what to do with those voices emotionally when they get hold of a song. Whereas on the other hand, uh, there have been singers who are famous for their ability to find the core of a song and project it who haven't been possessed of such technically wonderful voices. Which examples do you think fall most squarely into either camp? With that in mind, until the next time we meet together in good fellowship, or until the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff, and you stay righteous. Something that people say Kurt Cobain. Karen Carpenter was a bigger loss than Kurt Cobain.